Welcome everyone. My name is David Almeida. I'm Director of Research and Technical Strategy for LS Technologies. I'm excited to be moderating today's panel discussion on the introduction of service orientation at the Federal Aviation Administration and the modernization of our national airspace system using the event-driven architecture pattern. But first, allow me to introduce my colleagues, Joshua Gustin, uh, who is the Director of, uh, De Deputy Director for the FAA's Air Traffic Systems, uh, and Kristen Kropp, the SWIM Program Manager for uh, the FAA's um, SWIM Program. Um, Josh, can you give us a glimpse, just a glimpse of your background? Yeah, thanks for that that brief intro, David. And let me tell you a little more about myself. Um, I've definitely I've been in my FAA, been in the FAA uh, my entire career, and really around the data aspects of, of how flights move and how we do data analysis and strategic planning. Been in various roles in the FAA uh, of recent. I'm acting deputy director in air traffic systems, so that's the area of the program management organization where we kind of manage and build the systems that our workforce uses to manage the national airspace system. But I've also been the program manager of a traffic flow management system. Uh, I've been part of our airspace world uh, in performance-based navigation, part of our AIM world where we do uh, aeronautical information management. So you can kind of get that, that data aspect that I've been around in all of my, my jobs and my career. Um, and, and of recent, I'll mention the SWIFT that's on the screen, which we'll talk about later but an aviation forum just to talk about how our industry users use our FAA data. So uh, happy to be a big part of that. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And Kristen, how about you? Uh, can you get, give us a little bit about your background as well? Absolutely. Thank you so much, David. Um, as you mentioned, I am the SWIM program manager, um, system-wide information management. Um, and this is an enabling infrastructure program in the FAA. Um, so SWIM has led the way uh, in the FAA for making systems and services more accessible um, and data more freely available for many different applications. Um, and this has really allowed um, us to support our stakeholders from uh, controllers uh, to pilots, to ground handlers, um, even to the typical traveler. Since starting my uh, career in aviation, my focus has always been um, really on improving the operation and efficiency of the FAA. So whether it's uh, I've had opportunities of working in the field with air traffic controllers um, and air traffic managers or with airlines, as, as uh, Josh mentioned with the SWIFT, I've had the opportunity to work with airlines and third party vendors that are also helping to support that mission. Uh, my approach has always been to understand the operational problem first. Um, and this really is a, um, a great opportunity to start from that, come back and, and look at the technology and come up with ways um, and how we can solve this problem. And event-driven architecture um, that we use to swim is, is incredibly useful in, in, in helping solve a lot of our uh, users' problems. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, as for me, I, I've supported uh, industry transformations for nearly 30 years in telecommunications infrastructure and, and IT systems. I've supported the FAA on infrastructure and application modernization initiatives since um, back since 2004, um, as well as uh, migration to cloud infrastructure. I'm also part of the United Nations Aviation Branch, ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. It's a subject matter expert on information management and trusted communications. Um, but for our purposes, let's uh, maybe establish some context, starting by describing the FAA's mission in terms of running the busiest and safest airspace on the planet. There are two phases of air traffic management that we'll focus on today uh, in what's called the strategic management, which is these those activities associated with pre-flight planning and so on, and the tactical management, those that are affecting actual day of flight operations. We'll also touch a little bit on post-ops analysis, which is the post-operational view of uh, what happens um, you know, in, in the day of the life of the flight. Um, so Josh, can you help level set the audience with the FAA's operation? Yeah, yeah, and I'd like to really translate that down, down to the data and kind of why we're here today uh, to talk about a venture of an architecture as well as service oriented architecture and different ways we do things. Um, as I mentioned, I've been around this, this data my whole career and aviation, when you look at it, is really event driven. It's, it's highly sequential data it's highly interconnected data, especially when you get to strategic planning. 
if you think about it, I'm sure you all know this uh, as a fairly technical audience, you know, the closer an event happens in time, the more accurate it gets. We count on that accuracy, obviously, in separating airplanes and managing the NAS. And we can use that data that's less accurate for strategic planning the further out it is in time. So uh, the more predictive it is, the more prone it is to error. And our job is really to narrow that error down to make it to really useful information. Let me give you just a high level overview here, a very simplified view. Don't hang on every word I say here, uh, but think about that flow for a second, that picture at the bottom of the screen on how we all know that a plane flies. Um, if you think about the average person in the audience, the average person that you have at home, uh, most people think about the ticket that they buy. They plan their trip. And there's a little bit of data on that, that ticket, right? There's, we know when that flight's gonna be. We know roughly when it's gonna take off. We know roughly when it's gonna land. That's about it. That can be months ahead of time that you're buying that plane ticket. And that's what that data is for, is to sell plane tickets. Airlines publish that many, many months in advance in this huge batch of data that's a schedule and people start buying tickets. The FAA gets that data as well. And so that's where our strategic planning starts with this very high level, very raw, very rough data that has a very little bit of information. But it starts to, you can imagine, stack up that strategic planning aspect where we can start counting numbers of flights that are gonna hit us on a certain day, months and months in advance. That planning continues over that time. So we don't react to that really quick because again, it's very raw data. So then as you step forward, think about that, that flow and, and the data we have. Again, very rough data at that time that has a schedule, it has a start place, a departure airport, and a finish airport. That's all about selling tickets. It's really not about us managing the NAS, but we tap into everything we can to do that. Generally, that's, that's what I would call a bulk operation. The airlines publish that big bulk of data, tickets get bought, we get that same bulk of data, we start strategic planning. Then it really gets to the picture that's on the screen. We start tracking flights individually. So as the clock gets closer, that data gets more accurate. The schedule stays the same until an airline tells us by filing a flight plan that they're actually gonna fly. So that's when we had some intent data before that we think we're gonna fly to an airline telling us we are gonna fly. And that can actually happen days in advance as well. And we get better information. We get a better start time when, they're, when they think they're gonna push back from the gate a better end time when they think they're gonna land and a better proposed trajectory of how they think they're gonna fly from destination airport to arrival airport um, across the NAS, which could be, you know, imagine Boston to LA uh, or Boston to Newark, very different degrees of accuracy, right? That the airline can have. And also they don't know all everything that's gonna happen that day. The weather, for instance, is obviously a big impact on what that flight plan will be. But again, what I'll say is we now have better information and it's now transactional. It's one flight that we got better information on. And all of those flights, the time ticks and we'll get flight plans. Then when we get to the day of the flight, which is really what the graphic represents after that left block of flight planning, an individual flight pushes back from the gate. So we're not looking at passengers anymore, right? That's the airline's job. We never see any of that in the FAA, it doesn't matter. That airplane is moving and we now know it's really going. They push back from the gate. Obviously, the airlines have dealt with all kinds of data to make sure that everything's on that airplane, every passenger, uh, the food carts, the pilots, right? They do all that. We don't do that. The airplane pushes back. We know that. And now we can manage the air traffic system and know what that plane's going to do on the ground. The ground's harder to predict. Yeah, believe it or not, the airspace is much easier. So as they move across the ground, our data gets better and better to the point the plane takes off. Plane takes off, we get a departure message, we know the wheels are up. And at that point, believe it or not, we can predict really well what the time it is and the path it is that it's gonna to take to get from that departure to destination. All the way across the NAS, controllers are tracking that data. You see that all the time with the scopes and the radar, that's the actual reports. But we're projecting that ahead to make sure that if there's weather there, if we have to do anything to divert the airplane, that we know what the time is gonna be that it's gonna to take to get to that destination airport. And of course, there's variances along the way that we account for rerouting, whatever happens. Um, but eventually, we get an arrival message. And that flight goes down, the flight lands, and we have that time that the flight lands. And we can use that, again, as Dave said, going into our post-ops analysis for what's going to happen with that schedule data that I mentioned at the beginning and what it's going to look like again tomorrow or next week or next month. 
And there's a whole path there of data data accuracy that you can see really starts with this, this bulk transaction that's really about buying tickets that gives the FAA a glimpse at some really raw data to the actual transactions that happen across the NAS that's really event driven. Everything that happens starts a workflow from the, the ground movement and the ground controllers working that flight to the tower where it's taken off to work in that flight to get into the Emirate airspace to the Emirate controllers that work it all across the nation and then reverse it on the way down. And every event causes a trigger in data and a trigger in workflow that really creates the safety of the NAS. That's how the whole thing comes together. Excellent, that, that's an excellent overview. And I think that sets the context perfectly. Um, it, and, it, and it turns out that the, uh, the FAA is in the midst of a generational mass modernization through its next gen program. Um, and, and Kristen, I, I was wondering if um, you could tell us a little bit about next gen and how it expands the FAA's mission. Yes, thanks. Um, so as you can see, this is you know a, a rough cartoon uh, picture, a rough diagram of what the future airspace is is could potentially look like. Um, so um, the FAA and and commercial airlines are are getting to a point where we have to start to share our airspace um, with some new entrants. Um, uh, drones are are coming in, in so many different uh, uh, shapes and sizes. Um, supporting so many different types of operations, so many different types of trajectories um, that you see here. And one of the biggest changes that um, the FAA is, is, is facing right now um, is that industry is really forcing us, industry is driving us um, to have to modernize, um, to have to accommodate these different um, types of operations that really are all seeking um, not, not just um, new data, but additional data, you know, the, the amounts of data that we're having to um, continue to, 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 to move around just continue to increase and increase. So scalability is, is, is critical um, as we move into this future type of environment. Um, and also diversity, I mean, the different types of data. Um, we, know, we know commercial aviation well, we know what, what drives um, the operation, what, what helps to benefit the operation, but Again, when we're when we're moving into this this new world um, and and you know sharing the skies essentially with different types of operations, we have to look at other ways of um, um, using different uh, our our event mesh and communicating with other event meshes where you know we don't have to talk all the time. We don't have to know everything that you know is going on in a different airspace. But there are some critical um, situations or, or, or critical events where we should. Um, be able to communicate with each other um, and send messages back and forth. So this is a, a really exciting time to be involved with this. Um, and, and as SWIM continues to evolve, you know, these are the types of operations that we're really looking to, to be able to support. So, so yeah. it seems, go ahead, Josh. Uh, I just wanted to add to what Kristen says. And, uh, you know, when you look at that picture and it goes up and down, if you, if you think about my description, you know, for decades and decades and decades, we've been basically about horizontal flight, right? right. That that description of an airplane that, that goes goes again a, a, across the tarmac, takes off, goes over, and, and comes back down, and and so deconflicting that type was always a bit of a two dimensional and a, and a bit of a three dimensional picture, right? You can imagine that, but look at that picture on the screen. I mean, now we have rockets that look like airplanes that go up and a piece of them fall off and it lands. We never had to deal with that before. So where does the data come from? What does the data represent? How do we integrate that into what today might be a ground delay program and or an airspace flow program? Yeah, I echo what Kristen said. It's an exciting time because it's an exciting problem to solve. We will solve it, we always do. Um, and it's really a great data problem and really I think great for this audience because it's, it really gets to that data reflecting into the automation, how the automation works to, to bring to the users and the controllers what they need to do their jobs. Yeah, and, and that's actually the point I was, I was going to make, uh, is that it seems that these new services are going to create greater dependencies on automation, and that's going to create a whole other level of, yep. of uh, interoperability between internal and external automation systems, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, I did pull some some folks uh, that uh, might be attending the conference as uh, part of a virtual audience, and uh, we have a virtual question. Um, do you? And we'll we'll start maybe with um, with Kristen. 
Uh, do you foresee the FAA adopting microservices and using event-driven architecture for these future mission applications? Absolutely, as I, as I mentioned with uh, scalability um, and, and not only do we have a need to scale because of situations like this, but we also have a need to um, really look at getting services and, and, and providing functionality and features to our users at a, at a, at a faster rate. Um, and because of that, um, we are looking at opportunities. We are looking at ways um, in, in how we're looking for the future implementations of SWIM to get us to a point where we can be successful in you know, using microservices, uh, reusing them, relying on each, you know, each other to, to expand upon that and, and replicating those services. So absolutely. Excellent, and Josh? Yes. Yeah, yeah, to add, uh, I so again, echo what Kristen said, yes, um, mm -hmm. definitely microservices in, is in our future and in our present, by the way, we, we use a lot today, especially uh, where we communicate with airlines and, and outside audiences. Um, but really on a great, much greater scale, uh, we tend to, in our past, have built these large systems that have, have a mission to them. And so the microservice architecture was really within that one mission space and not really across all of the FAA automation mission space. And so we really want to open that up so that we can re really get greater reusability out of microservices, both inside and outside the FAA. And I'll even go as far to say, hopefully an environment where we can be crowdsourcing a lot of these ideas before they become safety critical applications to either try out on a very small scale or even on a large scale, what that service need might be and what that service might look like. And to do that, we need automation and platforms even to support that, that, that infrastructure need to support that. Yeah, and, and that's that's a, a, a very disruptive approach to, uh, uh, to what has been a very, yep. Um, traditional aviation marketplace. Um, great, great point. Um, so let's just take a second to walk through a little bit of the uh, kind of the journey uh, that the FAA has gone through. So, so system-wide information management or the SWIM program provides that messaging infrastructure for the FAA. Uh, Josh, can you describe the connections, uh, the nature of the connections between systems before SWIM, kind of that, that picture on the left? Yeah, I think the the distant history we've had, which which again I feel very lucky to have been a been a big part of this. Um, that left diagram, uh, it's what we like to call the ball of yarn. Uh, every system needed to talk and needed to talk to other systems. We knew that, and again, this is within the past few decades. Uh, and as we did that, we ran a wire and we connected the two systems together. I like to call that two cups and a string. Uh, but ultimately, two systems could communicate across a wire and they would share data and it works, right? The automation platforms, they don't care. That, that's just fine. And it works good for a one-to-one -one relationship. But what we found is more systems needed to talk to each other, which leads to the ball of yarn. Really, every system starting to connect to every system, which wasn't really making sense and it didn't scale. And you can see the number of connections that that leads to. So that history really led us to thinking about things like enterprise service buses and, and SWIM. Uh, which provides that. Excellent. Uh, Kristen, um, what about now? H how does SWIM make this exchange easier and more advantageous to FAA stakeholders? Yeah, so um, as Josh mentioned, you know, looking at what was, you know, initially um, introduced as part of SWIM was, um, you know, working with these systems to ensure that they were all speaking the same language, all, all reading and writing in XML. Um, but but not very feasible with all of the direct um, connections, the point to point from system to system. Um, so with the introduction of the um, messaging service and the infra infrastructure around that, um, we've now been able to move to a point where um, a lot of our data communication is through pub, you know published subscribe. So systems are able to you know publish once, be consumed by many. So um, in, in, in the environment, you know, again, looking back at that event driven environment this is very advantageous to, to what the NAS really needs and allows us to, you know, really ensure the timeliness of, of the receipt of the data, um, making sure that anybody can essentially assume whatever data it is that they need. So it's really um, ensuring that the users are getting what they need to, to support the operation. And Dave, if I can just add a little bit, um just don't want to downplay uh, what Kristen just mentioned, which is you mentioned the XML and the standards piece of this. Mm -hmm. um, really on the left, the ball of yarn, uh, when we have a system talking to a system, it was actually an easier time. 
because two programs were talking directly about data. They knew what they wanted. Uh, the providing program went private. It was a specialized interface, so it was tailored to meet their operational need. There was no worry about what the data meant to somebody that didn't understand. There was no worry about scalability and, and letting other people get this data. It was honestly a much more simpler time until the numbers grew, until the numbers grew and it became the ball of yarn. So, so like much of the rest of the world, we did introduce the standardization, again, primarily using XML, which meant you know defining fields and getting common understanding and having data dictionaries and writing it down. Um, and that really helped. And I, and I think there's a world of data on SWIM uh, that we have that information about. But we'll talk later about that still doesn't quite give you enough to put that data in context and apply it to another system when you don't know what it means. Uh, it takes not really, I, I hesitate to say a level of expertise about the data, but really how to put it all together, a real understanding of the data and where it comes from and whether it applies to the need that you're trying to apply it to now. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and in, interestingly, uh, that you're going down this path, um, the automation systems that you're talking about really run in the operational uh, environment, which is hosted on a tiered infrastructure. So everything we've really talked about has been this tiered infrastructure starting at the network layer. Um, that's broken into three domains for the FAA with administrative applications, research and development, and the operational systems that, that operate the national airspace system, which are hosted on an actual private network. Um, the current SWIM implementation is network centric, which is a, a distributed deployment architecture that provides kind of a, that data network that, that overlays uh, the operational network. So data models and standards like the one shown here uh, with the AIXM, which is for aeronautical information or FIXM for flight information or WXXM, which is for weather, um, certainly those, those da data models and standards uh, are increasing that connective fabric between the system applications at the applications here. So, so Kristen, um, can you describe the FAA's exchange, um, exchanges with external users that reside outside the FAA's operational network? Yes. Um, so today, um, SWIM, the, the infrastructure that is in place, um, a, a, a huge um, part of our users are external. Um, so be it between international users, um, be it airlines, third party vendors. Um, and so we have um, a NAS Enterprise Security Gateway, NESG in place, which, which provides that secure, um, safe connections to external users. So we're able to send messages um, out to them and they're able to send messages back into the FA, into the NAS through that through that gateway. Um, we have also introduced a, um, a, a SWIM cloud distribution service, SCDS, um, which has essentially put um, swim, a piece of the SWIM infrastructure in the cloud, um, making it a lot more accessible for, some, for external users to receive the data. They can use um, get a subset essentially of that data um, stripping out anything, you know, only putting in there what's what's publicly releasable. Um, but it, it, it's a faster way to connect for users um, and they're able to receive um, data to, for research and development or any types of analytics that, that Josh has actually talked about earlier. And, yeah. and add Dave, just uh, just because someone might ask, well, why do you do that? I mean, why do we exchange data with, with the outside world? and? And so, you know, yes, we have the radar. Yes, we know where the airplane is. So we definitely do the safe separation, but, but aviation is a business. And this, this whole business of it is part of that strategic planning that we do with the airlines and with the, with the flying, flying business uh, of biz jets and GA and everybody else that's involved in aviation. So to do that, we exchange data directly. And, and I'll take you back to that, that picture that, that, Kristen had up with the curves up there of the new airspace users, that exchange likely that intent that what has changed will be important to that, that continual data exchange. So there's a lot that we have to do for the outside world uh, to make all this works uh, work, especially with airlines who have the majority of that, especially uh, instrument flight airspace, uh, but as well as with airports uh, and again with GA to keep all of this, the, the, the aviation and the NAS working together. 
Well, Josh, let me ask you this. Um, you know, I remember back when I started working on Swim back in 2007, uh, there was this idea that web services would take over the world, you know? Uh, but 10 years later, 15 years later almost, uh, the FAA is still really heavily integrated using event-driven messaging. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I would say we use the technology that we need. So, so you know, pub sub, um, event driven, uh, whether it's batch, uh, everything has kind of a place. And again, this microservice architecture in the future kind of has a mix of that in it. Um, we often mix these things too. We'll do a, a request response that leads to a pub sub. Um, so there's different approaches to different things. Um, our, our NOTAM system, for instance, is very request response. You need a batch of NOTAMs to go for a bunch of flights uh, as opposed to individual. Pub sub is great for individual transactions where we're doing, in essence, database management or record management about a flight object to update it. And so we want to send as little uh, information as necessary. Really gets to the efficiency of, of the infrastructure stack more than any other reason to do it. Right, it's just a, just an efficient way to do it. So, um, so I I don't know that I agree. I don't remember that day in two thousand seven. I was probably there with you that uh, yeah. the web services would take over, um, but I do see a place for them and a continued place for for. I don't even want to say web services as a technology, but the need to request data and get a response back, as well as the need to subscribe data and get continual updates, uh, whether it's on an event or on a flight or anything like that. Um, and again, I like to think of event-driven as a little bit different than that because event-driven I look at as mostly a trigger. So that data for whatever reason comes in, whether I subscribe to it or I requested it. And when that event happens, it triggers a workflow, sometimes automated, sometimes people. And, and that happens throughout the NAS every single day. Excellent, excellent. Um, Kristen. Interestingly, we've talked a, a little bit about the FAA systems and, and that Swim provides kind of that connective tissue at the data layer between these systems. You, um, you've mentioned some of these, Josh has mentioned some of these. Can you talk a little bit about the information services uh, that support the operation and, and maybe in the context of some of the uh, application systems that, that we've highlighted in this graphic? Yes, absolutely. Um, and Josh did such a great job walking us through a, a flight um, in his uh, introduction that I am not even going to attempt to uh, compete with that. But, you know, similar to what Josh was saying, you know, all along, all along the, you know, a phase of flight, you know, you look at one aircraft and you look at all of the information um, through the services that are listed in this blue box here that, that the operator, um, the, the AOC, the, um, uh, operations center is able to receive and react accordingly. So in some cases, it's not even a matter of, um, you know, making changes to, to what, you know, the need is because of weather, because of constraints along the path that, that they're able to see through, you know, receiving information through all of these services. But sometimes it's really just planning, you know, knowing that they're going to have to take a hit, take a delay but plan for that, you know, add the extra fuel, um, notify the passengers, notify the people that are actually picking them up at the airport, different things like that. I mean, I, I think, you know, from, from this perspective, when you look at it from a single flight, the, the efficiencies that are gained um, based on these specific services, um, feeding and, and better, better informing the flight, better informing the operation, um, you take that and you multiply that by how many flights a day. I mean, it's 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 to me astronomical. Um, really, the benefits and opportunities that we are, are really saving here. Yeah, and and uh, Josh, we actually had a, a little bit of um, one of these virtual questions that came in um, uh, virtually live. Uh, what about data standards and, and how, um, how is the FAA addressing some of the new and evolving standards um, around technology? For example, advanced message queuing protocol, AMQP um, versus Java messaging services and so on. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? I don't know, Kristen might be better, but I will try because I will say, having been a part of this, you know, standards come and go. It's, it's really hard, especially those different uh, technology layer that you just described, Dave, with, with an underlying 
web services or PubSub. And so as we started standing this up uh, really through SWIM, we went pretty much with Java messaging as, as a as a PubSub type standard, but we did have a lot of legacy standards like ARINC MQ uh, as a standard that could have Java messaging writing in it or it could be totally different. Um, I, I must admit, we struggle with chasing every standard in the world. You know, should we do JSON? Should we have different transactions? All of that. And, and we really have to snap the line somewhere. And there are lots of converter tools out there that anyone can buy and can, can receive what we are publishing in one way and translate it to another way. Should we do that? Should they do that? Is always a common debate. Do we have to support everything? Every few years, we try and leap forward though. Are we doing the right thing with the right standards and should we change? And so we're constantly looking that. We will constantly evolve those standards. That unfortunately will lead to change for existing users and it makes new users very happy because they want the latest. So mm -hmm. it's really, it, it's hard, we can't do everything. And so we have to choose and snap a line at some point. If there is a technological advantage or reason as we do that kind of landscape and we look at that, then we will do it because we have a need for it internal to the FAA. And when we can do it internally, it's very easy to make it available externally as well. Yeah. And, and, and if we, I could. Yeah, go ahead. If I could add to that really quickly. Um, one thing that agency does not do well is is move quickly when it comes to new protocols and new data standards um with the legacy systems i mean we have just just the processes we have in place as a government um which are necessary but but sometimes there is you know time it, it, it's just a it's we're, we're fighting with time often um but we have learned um essentially how to create methods that allow us to cheat right so so we have put some where it is um, beneficial. We have put mediations in place um, and, and we are continuing to look at like what Josh says, you know, if it's beneficial, you know, having tools in place that we can do the mediation when, when it really is worthwhile. Excellent, perfect. In fact, I was just going to jump in with uh, and the FAA is employing mediation to do some of that, some of that yep. negotiations because candidly um, aviation investments, aviation is a, a high capital investment environment and and there are um, decades and decades of, of large legacy um, uh, systems that have to be integrated and so um, uh, Kristen to your point mediation I think helps a lot uh, with taking advantage of some of the new standards but yet adapting to um, uh, the information flows required from some of the legacy systems that that the various um, aviation enterprises have to deal with so um, Moving along, Kristen, you mentioned that extending the FAA's um, SWIM event messaging out to external users. We talked a little bit about that uh, earlier. Uh, I know the FAA has recently added access via cloud services. Can you describe the FAA's current model and where it's going, and including bi-directional um, exchange with the uh, external Absolutely. users? Yes, um, so as I mentioned in a previous slide, um, the FAA SWIM has implemented SCDS, the SWIM Cloud Distribution Service. So this has put a piece of this infrastructure in, in an external cloud. Um, so users are able to receive that data. Um, it, it has only helped in, in increasing ease of use. Um, it's, it's a shorter turnaround to being on ramps um, to the service to be able to get the data. Uh, users have a lot more insight into uh, the ability, it, into picking what type of data it is that they're that they're looking for, um, it's a lot more configurable, easier um, to use. But uh, as as they just mentioned, um, we're also um, working towards uh, near. You know, we're 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 getting there towards a, a point where we can put part of the, a piece of the infrastructure in a cloud um, that not only um, provides the ability to have bi-directional communications um, internal and externally, um, but also will be approved to support operations. Um, so it'll be a more secure um, data exchange. So uh, external users, airlines, um, third party vendors will be able to use this data similar to how they're using the data that they're getting through the NESG today, um, which again, opens up just more, more opportunities for um, use different use cases that they can use the data for to support their operation. It's a lot more usable. Um, and so again, and then as we move to the future uh, of SWIM, I think that may be Josh's point, so I can stop there. <laughs> well, yeah, Josh, do you have a, a comment around the future? 
Um, well, yeah, well, let, let me say, I mean, more to first the history on the left, right? If you go back decades, you know, we and, and even today, you know, we were based on hard wire circuits and the world's evolved beyond that, right? Internet and internet VPNs and connectivity. And so we offer that too. And you can connect to SWIM and you, and you have been. This, this newest iteration with SWIM Cloud SCDS kind of really opened that up because it was just too hard to have a wire from every single user, hundreds of them, uh, that, that I must admit are less consequential to us, many of them, they're not airlines. Why have that and why not just make it easily available? So we did that through SWIM Cloud. As we move further into that world, what Kristen just said, getting the, the two-way operation in that cloud as well, again, kind of gets rid of some of that physical need and gets more into a virtual need while still remaining, still keeping that resiliency that we have with, with multiple gateways, multiple connections, multiple clouds, um, and different, different ways to maintain those same needs that we've always had with that luxury, uh, but not running wires anymore and using more virtualization and VPNs and, and cloud. Um, uh, it's a first step. We see a lot more, again, the microservices conversation we just had, uh, a lot of that will play in this arena, uh, but baby steps for us. I, I think this will be a great operational step, which will give us really great wins, just getting to this ESCS point, And then the next steps will bring even more benefit later. Copy that. And I know we only have just a couple of minutes left, but I did want to kind of highlight some of the uh, FAA system events that are delivered as some information services. Because um, this leads us into a, a fairly interesting um, uh, topic around in external user engagement and, and community outreach. Uh, so as depicted here, you've got these uh, producer systems that we've talked about, uh, and we've kind of categorized the data and crafted these business services and pushed those through a uh, enterprise um, infrastructure security gateway uh, to be pushed out to external users. One of the things that, that we learned is that uh, business services, information services, data elements, these terms uh, are sometimes have the potential of being overloaded terms uh, used um, when used internally within an enterprise or uh, interoperably with external users as well. And so the wanted to wrap up today's session to talk talking a little bit about stakeholder engagement. And the FAA has established a forum known as the SWIFT or the uh, SWIM Industry FAA Team. And Josh, in large part, this is your brainchild and as the sponsor, can you provide some insights into what, what this is and, and why we bothered? Yeah, thank you. So um, thank you for that opening. It's a great one. Um, you know, the last slide showed you the world of data that's provided from the FAA today via SWIM. Um, and as Dave said, these terms are overloaded. You know, if your job is to provide weather information, then you think that's a business service because that's my job. <laughs> but we call that a producer because you're just producing information. Virtually every FAA system produces some information, whether it's again, a source like a weather system uh, or whether it's a strategic planning system that's giving, that's the result of all that, that's providing those strategic plans. So there's, there's a world of data, terabytes and terabytes of data that the FAA provides through SWIM Cloud, through SWIM um, to users. So what do they do with it? And that's always, that's been the challenge. Um, I've been a part of the Next Gen Advisory Committee where we've talked about this for many months and years of thank you for, you know, thanking the FAA for providing all of this data. Now what? There's so much, we don't know what to do with it. And as you look at just a simple one, the, the top of the last chart was weather. What weather, right? What particular, what are you trying to know? Is it raining? Is that what you want to know? That's a, that's one service, right? Is, is it raining on the ground or in the sky? That's a, That could be a completely different service. If you don't know that, it might just say raining. So how do I apply that? And where does that expertise come from? You know, I like to use a, a, a bit of a dated example uh, around ETA. Uh, in our past systems, and not the current FAA system, but one of our past systems, we published an ETA. And the business service that that ETA was used for was it was estimated time of arrival to an airspace. Anybody on the outside world receiving that would assume it's when the plane arrived on the ground at the gate. So putting that data into context and then applying it to a business problem becomes the issue. And so we created the SWIM to solve exactly that discussion and that problem to bring together the right expertise 
to kind of crowdsource. So we have, you know, it's not a meeting with one airline or one user. It, it's with them all at once to share information together, to share the common operational problems and to provide data solutions to those problems, to put our FAA data, that world of data into context and figure out how to apply it to solve their problems. Sometimes we just learn together just by talking, whether it's DOD being there or NASA being there or MITRE being there or an airline being there or GA being there, but that common conversation around the application of this data to solve an operational problem becomes really the, the what this forum brings together. Um, and it, we're on our third or so year, Dave, and you know people keep coming back. So I always tell them you're coming back, so we must be filling a void. We just got to figure out what we're doing right. And I feel like we keep doing it right because they keep coming back. Yeah. Roger that. And and um, Kristen, uh, Josh mentioned a little bit about the operational context documents and how the FAA is in, in essence in, invested quite a bit in, of energy and, and resources in that. Um, can you describe what those are and, and why those matter, um, why those resources are, are worth it and based on some of the feedback that you've received. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the operational context document really um, is, is kind of taking a, a snapshot, looking at the operation very closely, um, working with the internal programs that are actually you know, running the systems and, and being able to put um, in paper put down on paper, what is the operation? What are we really doing here? And it really provides a lot of um, insight from an external user's perspective, insight that they typically do not have. Um, so really, it, it, to me, it feels it's it, it's a, an activity and, and, and they're worked on jointly too. So it's, it's a learning you know, process. The whole thing is a process, but it's an opportunity to really start to bring you know, multiple worlds together um, to, so that the picture, you know, the perspective is is a lot more common, um, and and they are extremely well received. Um, the information that's within them is extremely well received, and and something that I do think that you know, SWIM continues to strive um, to improve is how do we better communicate the data that we do have. Um, Swift is a great you know forum. It's a great opportunity. But even for, for somebody who's not involved at SWIFT, you know, wh where do they go to see what exactly it is and, and how do we translate, you know, what the lessons learned or what are the, you know, the productivity coming out of, of SWIFT and put that in, you know, an NSRR or put it in some type of registry where, where that's actually, you know, easily um, found over and over again. Um, so, yes, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. The SWIFT is, is an endless um realm of uh, opportunity for, for both sides. It's mutually beneficial um, as we go. And and, and uh, uh, what I, what I, the way I love to say it is, uh, you know, because the FAA has so much data, so many systems, and again, all these legacy. Um, uh, my, my favorite example is the estimated time of arrival. And 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 you saw that, that phase of flight, uh, those phases of flight. Um, an arrival point can be anywhere in the span of that, that era, uh, life cycle. Um, so it's interesting to, to make sure that the user has the right context of what arrival means, uh, given the data that they're subscribing to and the events that they're looking for and, and listening for. So we have one more virtual question, virtually live question that came in uh, that I thought was a, a good way for us to, to end. Um, and in and maybe 30 seconds or less, um, uh, Josh, maybe we'll start with you. What, what are your biggest challenges uh, from an FAA perspective, particularly on the automation side, and how would you uh, like to see them solved from an information management, um, information exchange perspective? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so two challenges I'll I'll mention real quick. So that's fifteen seconds each. Got to speak fast. Um, one is legacy systems. Um, you know, legacy systems are great publishers of data. They are typically many of them are the source of the data, whether they're legacy or modernized. Um, but they are not able to use the data easily, and we are slow to modify those systems. So not sure you can help with that, but that is definitely one of the biggest challenges we have in getting data out and getting data in to be useful. Um, the second would be really more around an opportunity. I think there's a great opportunity around crowdsourcing and using the world uh, to solve FAA problems. Um, a lot of what we talked about with microservices and data. So 
I think if, if we in the FAA continue to make data available, as I've said, terabytes of data, as you saw in that eye chart earlier on what SWIM provides today, then I think you all in the world will come up with solutions at least to put initial on the table uh, to solve operational problems, whether the FAAs or the airlines, because both give us value for those. And, and again, SWIFT is an environment where we can bring those to see if there is real value. I think those, those what I like to call widgets, those small projects, those proving things that in the future could become an operational microservice, we'll, we'll be able to move us ahead a lot quicker than we can today if we start writing requirements. Excellent, excellent. And, and Kristen? Um, I'd say my biggest challenge is um, cultural. I think it's it, it, there's a big change. There's a big shift that that has to take place. Um, industry is moving at a much faster pace than than we're able to um, within the government. And um, I, I think that you know there's so much opportunity here. The technology is here. Um, and in many cases, we know what has to be done. But but I think we also have to continue to work to to show. Um, to show the benefits, to be able to prove that we can keep keep operations safe, if not make them safer, by by adopting you know more modernized technologies, more modernized ways of doing things. Um, so so I do think you know as we work, I mean it's really it, it, it's really pivotal um, to be able to bring those lessons learned back to help to shuttle uh, along um, the, the FAA to really meet um, the industry pace. Yeah, yeah, safely and efficiently, right? I think Absolutely. the airlines, the uh, airspace users, not just airlines, but your uh, business aviation, yeah. the commercial space operators that are going to be coming more uh, frequent and so on. Um, so first and foremost, thank you both very, very much for your time and um, and experience uh, with um, system wide information management and uh, your experience with event driven architecture. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. All right. Dave. Thank you.